Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Sharon Finolio, the Associate Vice Chancellor for Advancement at UMSL, and I would like to welcome you and thank you for joining us this evening for this, our first virtual UMSL Legacy Council Lecture Series, How to Get Your Affairs in Order. After popular demand, we are thrilled to bring this presentation by Tom Nations back to such a large and wonderful group. But before we get started, I'm going to go over a few housekeeping items. First, if you need technical support, we will have someone on standby to help. The best way to reach out is through email. If you need help, please email executiveevents at umsl.edu. Again, that's executiveevents at umsl.edu. Second, we will be using the Q&A feature on Zoom for you to ask questions. This is located in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Questions will be monitored and addressed at the end of the presentation. We will answer as many questions as possible and any unanswered questions will be addressed by Tom Nation, our presenter, and sent via a follow-up email. This presentation is being recorded a link will be sent in a follow-up email to all registrants, and it will also be housed on the UMSL website for future reference. So now, without further ado, it is my sincere honor and privilege to introduce Chancellor Kristen Sobolik. For three years, Dr. Sobolik served as provost and then interim chancellor at the University of Missouri-St. Louis as an agent of positive change and growth overseeing and implementing key initiatives that have strengthened the university and expanded our reach across the United States and internationally. Now, she leads on an even larger scale as the university's eighth chancellor, both at UMSL and in previous positions as the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts at Wright State University and Associate Dean of the College of Liberal Arts at and Sciences at the University of Maine, Chancellor, Chancellor Sobolik has proven herself as an effective advocate with alumni, donors, and legislators. She has demonstrated unparalleled ener energy and enthusiasm for UMSL while working to advance the university, providing opportunities for students to fulfill their aspirations, and solidifying the university's crucial role in St. Louis and beyond. During her time as provost, UMSL launched multiple new academic programs, including recent new degrees in cybersecurity, sports management, and organizational leadership. And she has worked to broaden our international reach through partnerships and recruiting under UMSL Global. Notably, Sobolik led the development of UMSL's five-year strategic plan in 2018, and around the same time, helped shepherd the process for renewal of the university's accreditation from the Higher Learning Commission. As a nationally recognized scholar and professor who helped develop the fields of archaeobiology and paleonutrition, Sobolik has more than 100 scientific publications, books, and presentations. We are thrilled that she could join us this evening and greet many of you for the first time as the Chancellor of the University of Missouri, St. Louis. Now, thank you for that lovely introduction, Sharon, and thank you all for joining us. It is wonderful to come together as best as we can these days, though I do look forward to the time when we can see each other face to face. We are cautiously optimistic about the chance to do that in the coming months. You may already know that this fall, the University of Missouri St. Louis plans to blend on campus and online learning to create an environment that is conducive to education and public health and safety. Through all the upheaval the pandemic brought our way, our highest priority to provide a high quality affordable education for UMSL students has never wavered. And while the current situation with COVID-19 has made this a greater challenge, what I've seen in the last few months at UMSL is an avowed dedication to our student experience that will carry us beyond these extraordinary circumstances. Not only are we at the center of a global health crisis, we are also experiencing a powerful moment in history 
one that demands we all work together to inform, educate, and address the social injustices and inequities that affect our community, region, and nation. I am confident that UMSL will be a center not only for academic excellence, but inclusive excellence to support our students and graduates. I know you are here to learn more about the important topic of personal financial planning. That's why I'm here as well, and why I plan to stay on to listen and learn. But I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't make a pitch for the University of Missouri-St. Louis and our fantastic students as a conduit for your legacy through estate planning. In a moment, you will see a video that empowers some of our outstanding UMSL scholarship recipients to share how the kindness of someone's philanthropy transformed their lives. Everyone attending tonight understands the value of higher education as a path to a better place in life. I hope you will be inspired to help remove financial barriers to education for students like those in the video through the power of your planning and giving. Scholarship donors and organizations. Scholarships are one of the many reasons I am so glad I chose to go to UMSL. The opportunities they provide are hard to put into words. I'd like to take this chance to express how honored I am to be a recipient of this scholarship. I am so grateful and appreciative that people who didn't know me decided to invest in my future in higher education. This scholarship award enables me to pursue my dream of getting my BS so that I may continue on to get my master's. UMSL is my dream school. I am so beyond grateful for the opportunity to attend without the financial burden it would have put on my family. Growing up in Kenya, I had the unwelcome opportunity to see people suffering from preventable illnesses. When I came to the U.S., I knew that I needed to go into healthcare. I'm a first-generation child of immigrant parents who escaped war and poverty to reach the U.S. in hopes of a better life for them and their future children. No one in my family has ever graduated from a four-year university. I live with my sister and mother who both work at the loading dock in Grafton, Illinois. Unfortunately, we do not make enough money to pay for my tuition without taking student loans. In 2005, I was declared legally blind. I decided I would take a couple of classes. I wasn't aware that that was only my beginning. I sometimes faltered, but then I remembered that I had these scholarships. Because of this, I have a large group of wonderful people who constantly drive me to do better. The scholarships I've received have made me more grateful and motivated for my education than ever. This program has allowed me to overcome fears, break new boundaries, and strive for bigger goals than I could ever imagine. Without this generosity, I wouldn't know where I would be today. I want everyone to know that being disabled doesn't hinder you. It's not a curse. I want to express my sincere gratitude for your recognition and support of a young, underrepresented student and her efforts. This is truly the best opportunity I have ever had. I am now a senior at UMSL. I am and have been a Dean's List student my entire time. My collegiate journey has helped me to find my purpose. I am proud to say that I am purposed to help people through music. I will harness my full potential to make a difference in the community. Please know that your gift will make a big difference to me, my family, and the many people who I will have the privilege to care for. I would be honored to meet you and personally thank you. And I hope one day I will be able to assist students the same way in which you've helped me. Thank you for taking the financial burden off of my shoulders so that I may soar and be the light that I know I'm supposed to be in the world. Thank you. Thank you again for joining us for this informative session. It is now my pleasure to introduce this evening's presenter, Tom Nations. 
Tom graduated from the UMSL College of Business in 1980 and is one of the 75,000 UMSL alumni who proudly call St. Louis home. Tom went from UMSL to Washington University School of Law. He began practicing law in 1983 and concentrates in the areas of family matters, estate tax, small business representation, and probate. Tom is here to guide us through this updated session on how we get our plans in place and help us learn about estate planning resources. I know we all appreciate his offer to share valuable insight into his area of expertise. So take it away, Tom. Well, thank you very much, Chancellor. I offer my congratulations and my welcome to you as, an, as our new Chancellor, and I hope for you every success. I will look forward to meeting you in person. And thank you to all of our attenders this evening. Thanks for taking some time out of your schedules to consider some of these important, I think, issues for individuals and families, which have become all the more significant during the, during the wake of this COVID-19 pandemic. So I am going to put my presentation up. Well, COVID-19 has certainly upended our previous routines and irregular activities or occasional activities and has made very apparent the, how little control we have over the major events in our lives and how quickly and unexpectedly those routines and activities can be interrupted or ended. While ultimately little has changed, we are now faced with one more set of risks and threats with which we must work and deal in our everyday lives. The purpose of this presentation is to give you a basic understanding of the considerations we have in planning for both certain and uncertain futures. I'll make this presentation in about 40 minutes and afterwards we'll have the uh, opportunity to answer questions that you may have. Thank you again for joining us. When we talk about getting our affairs in order, we're, we're talking about a couple of things. One would be we're so busy doing other things, some of the matters for which we have responsibility and have neglected need attention. The other would be that we're anticipating a time when we can no longer handle our own affairs, either because we're disabled or deceased and somebody else has to take care of those things for us. So, in trying to figure out how to do those things, I think it's helpful to kind of define the elements that we're looking at. Those are the components of estate planning, the, the matters and things that we are addressing. So an estate plan is the instructions that we give as to how and when the resources that are available to you and your family are going to be used by you and your family and ultimately passed from one generation to the next. So those components, there's four basic parts, the current management and use of assets. That's what you're doing right now. You have your stuff and you're using it the way that you want to for the most part or the way that you'd like to and maybe you have some aspirations to do some different things. The next component is planning for your future. That would be the management and use of your, your assets, the application of them tomorrow and from then on. The next piece is succession planning, getting your estate to your beneficiaries. That is when you are done using them for your benefit, your immediate benefit and your immediate family, how do you get them to the people or entities that you want to benefit? And then as a, as a overall component of all that, we're looking at your liabilities and your expenses and how we manage those in the management and use of our assets, how we avoid liabilities and expenses to the extent that we can and how do we minimize them to the extent that we can't avoid them. So once we know what those components are, we develop goals and objectives with regard to each one of them. And the goals are to come up with a plan of some kind that will will express what those intentions and goals are. We, we talk about the present administration while we're healthy here and doing the things that we're doing and then what might happen and what will we want to have happen when one of us, when, when we become incapacitated or disabled. So two parts of 
present administration of our stuff for ourselves. Succession planning, again, is moving our estates into someone else's hands. And there's three basic considerations there. One is lifetime giving as we start to move resources. We all give gifts. Sometimes it's just gifts to family. Sometimes it's gifts to charities or to others. There's other lifetime dispositions that we make of our property in anticipation of, of resigning from them or, from, or moving on to other things. Uh, distributions at death and at our disability or event time events at which we have to look at what we might do and what of our property we might deal with in those circumstances. And then charitable giving is both a lifetime consideration and a post-death consideration. I, I talked about expenses and liabilities before. Tax planning is a big part of that. And when we're talking about the goals and objectives, that rises to a little higher level usually than the, the ordinary expense and liability planning. So I make that a separate bullet point here, avoiding and minimizing taxes to the extent that we can. And then we also take a look at what we have and what we're doing with it and what are good ways of providing ourselves the protection that's just available to us in uh, with respect to our assets, that is asset protection, to maximize our benefit and minimize the, the, what might be taken for liabilities and expenses. So you, you get the idea in just these things that I've talked about. I've talked about from, day, from now until the time after we die and we start talking about the people that are involved and all the questions that have to be answered and all the things that we need to do. It seems like an insurmountable task but I, I like to say that we approach it the same way we'd approach eating an elephant. How do you do that? You do it one bite at a time. So that's kind of the way I've tried to lay this presentation out for you. We're going to take it little pieces at a time, and then we just bite them off as we go. One of the things that stops literally people from doing their planning is just the overwhelming amount of information and possibilities that have to be addressed between now and the next hundred years or so. Um, Plans can look out and be functional that, that long. And any plans that we put together are, that, are good for that long. But they won't be as good in 15 or 20 years as they will be in the next three or four. So as you begin to think about what you need to do, let's do your planning as though you'll need to rely on it in the next three to five years. You can see how things are right now. You can see what you have, you know what your circumstances are, you can look out to some extent in that three to five year window and say, okay, depending on what happens, these are the things that I would like to see happen and these are the people that will be involved in helping me get to that place. When I got out of law school, the first estate planning client that I had had been waiting for me to get out of law school. He called and he said, Tom, I'm 95 years old and my wife is 98. We need to do an estate plan. Do you think I have waited too long? No, he hadn't waited too long. He still had the opportunity to do it, but he waited longer than we might have wished that he would gamble on. So when we, when we start thinking about these issues again, as I said, we're thinking about what plans you would make in the event you become disabled and what plans you would make in the event of your death. All right. So we're going to start at the very beginning. We're going to take an inventory of what you have. And I recommend getting a notebook out to start to collect this information. We, we would like to see you have in a, in a convenient place, convenient for you and convenient for anybody that might have to take over after you, a list of all of your assets and liabilities. And these are as easy to create as when you sit down to pay your bills on a monthly basis, just print off if you do it by e-filing or if you do it by old-fashioned paper, just take a copy of those bank statements, uh, account statements, mortgage statements, credit card statements, investment accounts, IRA statements, whatever you get, and stick it in that folder. You only need to do it here at the beginning till you get a collection of all those things and make a list of them so that they're kind of organized for us. But you just stuff that in the folder. Then you have an idea of what you have. If down the road, you get a new asset, put something about that asset in the folder. If you sell something, make a note on what was in there and say, this is gone as of now. Same thing with liabilities. Just make a note about it so that 
when the next person comes along, they have a pretty good idea of where things are. One of my pet peeves is having to look for things. So the, the closer proximity things are and the easier they are to find, the greater benefit that you can do. Uh, the other thing to take an inventory is of your family and your situation. The most difficult decisions that people have, in my experience, in doing their estate planning, the, the, the ones that they struggle with are, if you are not able to take, to manage your affairs or to take care of yourself, who is going to do it? Usually, a, a spouse is an easy choice, but other than that, it is frequently a difficult question. One of the ways that I help folks in making that decision is I remind them that if you don't decide who's going to do it, if you become disabled, something happens to you today and somebody needs to step in and take care of you, someone is going to decide how to do that other than you. And you can figure out who that is. If it's kids, they're going to do it. If it's your siblings, they might do it. If it's your parents, they might do it. I have clients who have neighbors who look in on them and they have to make the decision. So I say, go to those people and ask them who they might recommend to be the people would help you at the time that you can't do it. Another thing then to take inventory of with regard to your family members is, do you have relatives with special needs of any kind? Um, whether it's physical special needs, intellectual special needs. Some folks have uh, family members that they provide for. Do you have elderly parents that you might need to make provision for? Do you have adult children that need help from time to time, although they're not dependent on you? Or do you have children that are going to need some help from you for the rest of their life? On the, on the flip side of that coin, do you have relatives with special abilities? There are a lot of roles to be undertaken in connection with these plans. And if you have family members that have particular gifts or special abilities, make sure they're on the list and they can help you with the process, either now and going forward or when it comes time for someone to take over for you. And then trusted advisors. Will you need to enlist somebody outside your family to accomplish your estate planning goals? We can't do all things and be all things to all people and and sometimes we already have some trusted advisors we'll talk about those in a little bit specifically but of all of these people are you dealing with them right now and how so and how do you anticipate dealing with them in the future if circumstances change and you don't need to answer all these questions tonight you can do deal with these one at a time as you answer one move on to the next and I tell folks when you're considering these things, if you come to a question you just can't answer, skip it. Go on to the next one. Uh, that's You may not get 100% uh, on the test, but you're going to score big because you've answered most of the questions and you've answered them well. And that's just the way to do it. And then you have a chance to think about it. You might go back and come up with a good answer a little bit later on. As we go on here, I frequently hear oh, I don't have an estate plan, I need to talk about that. And it's really worse than that. You do have an estate plan. It may not be written down. Your estate plan is written in the way that you own property. It is written in the relationships that you have with people that are around you. And it relates, it, it, it bears on maybe beneficiary designations that you've made on property that you have. A big problem with these methods is you end up having a different estate plan for every different asset that you have. If you have a house and a car uh, and a bank account and an investment plan, each one of those has their own title. And if you want to change the beneficiaries of those things, then you have to go to each one. And it makes it difficult to keep up with everything. Now that binder that I told you about makes it a little easy because you know what and where everything is, but it still becomes very, very cumbersome. Uh, as I said, the way that you hold title to your property is, is a big indicator of your estate plan. You all have heard of joint ownership. That is, you may have a title, it's in the name of two or more people, and it'll say joint tenants or joint ownership or 
joint tenants with right of survivorship. Sometimes you see JTWRS. What that means is two or more people own a piece of property. Any of the joint tenants, as we call them, has the right to the entire thing. They could, if you have a bank account and there's three people on it, any one of the three can just take that. When one of the joint tenants dies, the remaining joint tenants own the whole thing. The person who died owns nothing. The last person living takes the whole asset. Any other joint tenants have got nothing because they have predeceased. And then at that point, that joint owner owns it by sole ownership. Tenants in common, you've probably heard of. That's another multi-owner ownership, but each person owns a, a distinct interest. If you are a one half tenant in common, you actually own a half that on your death passes to your heirs. The surviving owner doesn't take that piece. If you've inherited property with your siblings, um, you own that property in all likelihood as tenants by in, like, tenants in common, and you own an equal share with each of them. Tenants by the entireties, you'll sometimes see TE. Sometimes the property will just say husband and wife. That's a joint ownership between husbands and wives and the surviving spouse ends up taking the whole the whole property. There's some special incidences of that kind of a tenancy, but basically that's how that works. And then sole ownership is one person on the title and no other provisions for it. You, you've probably heard about transfers on death. Those are designations that we've been allowed to make here the last few years where you can take any of these kinds of properties that you own and you can say, on my death, I want this property to pass to so-and-so or who and who. Um, and those are very popular. They're inexpensive. They're easy to set up, uh, but they also create the problem still of having a different estate plan for each person, for each asset that you have. And they only deal with the property in the event of your death. They don't protect you against things that might go wrong during your lifetime. Uh, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, I, I do want to talk about probate because that's that four letter word that we all hate I know it's a seven letter word because the lawyers got to it and they just made it bigger than it needed to be, which we want to do. But probate is not a bad thing. It is the system, a process or a system by which property is dealt with when an owner cannot do it, either by reason of death or their disability. On, on death, we typically just call it probate. On a disability, we call it guardianship or conservatorship. The other thing the probate court is responsible for is ensuring that people are cared for in the event they cannot care for themselves and haven't made any other provision for that. So guardianship in Missouri, and different states have different words for it, but in Missouri, guardianship is personal health care and well-being decisions. Where you're going to live, how you're going to have medical care, what medical care you're going to get, the guardianship is supervised by the probate court just as a safety net for the person. Conservatorship is somebody who is appointed to manage your financial affairs. Frequently, it's the same person as the guardian, but often it's not necessarily the same person. They are responsible for conserving your assets and applying them for your benefit. And then again, decedents estates, that's for a dead person, and those are either intestate in which the person did not have a will and testate in which they did have a will. So that's probate in a nutshell. One of the things that we're trying to do is avoid that. As I said, probate is not a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. If we didn't have it, most of the property in this country would be owned by the government. But it is expensive and it is time consuming. And that's because the person who had the ability to avoid it didn't avoid it. You know the old saying, and I may say this more than once, where there's a will, there's a bundle to be made by a probate lawyer. Okay, so we're, we're beginning to inventory our current situation. Uh, we're looking at the things that we have, assets and liabilities. We're looking at our human resources, uh, the people that we deal with, both that we care for and that care for us and are going to help us as we move forward. And then another 
factor that we take into account are taxes. Uh, Benjamin Franklin was wise and didn't have near the problems that we face these days, although they did have tax considerations in those days. The, the taxes that we are looking at are inheritance taxes, estate taxes, gift taxes, and income taxes. Now, I talk about in inheritance taxes because I still suffer from a wound from them. When I graduated from UMSL in 1980, I started working for my dad and his law firm, and Missouri had an inheritance tax. And that's what I did. I was working part-time, so I did these returns, and I really got good enough at it that their dad was actually making money off of me, which was a miracle. And then in 1983, about the time I got out of law school, Missouri repealed the inherited tax. They repealed everything that I knew. And since then, the same thing has happened with estate taxes, gift taxes, and income taxes. So one of the reasons that we plan for the relatively near future, the next three to five years, is because even in this important area, the future is always uncertain. So taxes are always a consideration. Estate taxes are a federal and state tax that are imposed on the estate of the person who dies based on its value. Gift taxes are gift taxes on gifts that we make during our lives. And of course, income taxes are taxes on income from, which is money received from just about any source that can be deemed to be income. All right, so we, we know the situation that we have. We know the components. We have our goals. We know the people that are involved. We've talked about these big issues. Now we need to begin to put them into a plan. There are some things that you can do along these lines, and you may already have some ideas about those things in your head. There, there are some things that we can't do that we may need help with, and these are some of the people that can help you with guidance and making and implementing a good working estate plan. I'm sure you're familiar with these, but everybody has a kind of a different perspective and a different role. And if you have one, it doesn't mean, or if you don't have one, it doesn't mean that you're you're at a disadvantage. You just have different perspectives from, from where you are. Financial planners and advisors are more just that. And I don't mean just, but they are financial planners. They look at your financial resources and see how you are going to use them and what you might do to be most efficient and economical for you purely from a financial standpoint. Insurance professionals all look at us uh, from the perspective of risk and avoidance of risk, protecting against risk, and insuring against risk. So that's the perspective that they come from and they're valuable in many situations because we can't assess those things ourselves. Accountants look at us as we are and what we have, and they're able to tell us what our future looks like based on that and help us make adjustments and decisions on the basis of those that might be beneficial to us. Lawyers, we lawyers, uh, are the ones that take your plans and put them down in documents that end up working for you. I see my job as a relationship job and how am I going to lay out a plan that is going to express what you want the way that you want it to be and for the people who read it and have to deal with it later on to understand exactly what you meant without any confusion. Uh, charitable entities are valuable resources for helping to make plans. Many people are only beginning their charitable giving uh, thoughts when they start thinking about estate plans. Maybe they haven't even begun it, but charitable entities themselves just have a wealth of information about incredibly economic and efficient ways to incorporate charitable giving in a plan that you might not otherwise have considered. And then professional trustees, when we talk about trust and we talk about these other incidents, we're always talking about somebody that is acting on someone else's behalf. That would be a fiduciary. And there are, uh, there are banks and big institutions that have trust departments that serve those roles. There are private trust companies, and that's all that they do. And then there's, there are lawyers and others that do it. I'm a professional trustee for certain individuals and under certain circumstances. And the benefit of those folks is they have real boots on the ground, 
practical experience with administering estates, with dealing with family members that don't necessarily have somebody that can fill that role, but need somebody to do it. And so we, we talk with them frequently about circumstances and say, hey, what's your experience with this kind of thing? And can we make our instruments better to provide and protect for the folks for whom we're trying to plan? All right, now we have our list of things that we wanna do and we have our list of the people that are gonna help us do it and the people that we can look to moving forward. What are, what are these things that we're gonna do? I call them the tools of the trade. These actual documents that then that we're gonna start looking to put together. And remember I said, this is a preliminary kind of a thing. We're not getting into things that are terribly sophisticated, but these are the fundamental estate planning instruments that we all need to think about. First one is a power of attorney. That's a instrument that we're, by which you give someone else the power to handle your affairs for you. We typically split those into two different things, one financial and one healthcare. And as you can guess, financial power of attorney gives someone the ability to deal with your financial and business concerns. The healthcare power of attorney gives someone the ability to do those things. One thing, the, the person that serves you under your power of attorney is your agent or your attorney in fact. If people wanna be an attorney, they can be an attorney in fact, and that's their title under a power of attorney. We frequently will just call that person a power of attorney, but you'll hear the words agent and attorney in fact, and that's who they are. With respect to the healthcare power of attorney, that one is significant. I think there are two things that are important. When you're picking a person to serve as an agent under your power of attorney, Typically, you've given some instructions. You'll do a living will of some kind or an advanced medical directive, some kind of a healthcare directive like that. But in default of, of you express something that meets the particular circumstances, you'll name somebody to make decisions for you. You need to be sure that you give that responsibility to someone that can actually do what you want them to do. So you wanna talk with, if you're considering appointing a kid or a sibling, you need to talk with them to make sure that they understand what you want and expect and make sure you understand their perspectives and then choose the people that are gonna be ready, willing and able to care for you the way that you would like. It happens very often that, that a, a mom will appoint her daughter to serve as an agent under the power of attorney and then mom gets in the, the power of attorney says i don't want any heroic measures but mom fails and the daughter just can't do it and it make, creates a difficult situation for the family and that that's not something that you want to put on somebody that can't do it so talk it out make sure that everybody understands each other another phrase that you'll hear in connection with these healthcare powers of attorney and financial powers of attorney, as a matter of fact, is the term springing power of attorney. That means the power of attorney has a provision in it that says that it comes into effect, it springs into effect on the occurrence of some event, usually disability or incapacity. I personally advise against those provisions. Uh, as the chancellor, a, a told you a few minutes ago, a big part of my practice is beyond estate planning is probate related things. And a part of my, a big part of my probate practice involves those kinds of provisions. And if there's ever a fight over whether the springing condition has been met, the combatants have to go to court to get it resolved. That's probate that we're trying to avoid. And, and the way that that happens is dad appoints a kid as an agent under the power of attorney and then a few years goes by and dad loses his ability and the kid comes to him and says it's time for me to take over and dad says oh no it's not i'm revoking the power of attorney and we're stuck or the kid goes to dad and says it's time for me to take over and his brother says oh no it's not you're a crook i'm taking over and we end up in court so those are the kind of things that we're looking to avoid and it's more important to put together a good plan than to try to placate the kids in the meantime. Most of the time that leads to trouble. All right, other tools of the trade. Lifetime transfers, that's kind of a broad category. That's any, any 
uh, practice that you do, anything that you do to begin to affect the transition of your property to your beneficiaries during your life, uh, whether it's lifetime gifts, whether it's doing a trust that I'll talk about in a minute, um, or any of uh, buy-sell agreements or lifetime transfers, things like that. Transfers on death, I talked about a minute ago. Uh, we use these in organized, efficient estate plans, but I think we're best advised to use them sparingly and only for very limited purposes. And we can talk about that another time. Wills, uh, wills are an essential estate planning instrument. Uh, having a will is always better than not having one, even if it's the only estate instrument that's used. It can facilitate the administration and distribution of an estate much more economically and efficiently than having no will at all. But wills require probate. They only work in probate. And like I said before, where there's a will, there's a bundle to be made by a probate lawyer. We do wills as a safety net. If, if you've executed other plans that effectively and efficiently will transfer your property, avoiding probate, there's always the chance that we missed an asset or frequently folks will inherit an asset and not get it into some other mode of transmittal and it'll end up being a probate asset. So it's a part of a plan, but it's one we hope we don't have to rely on. There are a couple of other things that we can do in wills that we can't do anywhere else, but for functionality, this is what we use them for. And then the other instrument that we use are trusts. These trusts have become the go-to tool with and around which good estate plans are built. The advent of the computer and the laser printer has made them economical for just about everybody, and they become the centerpiece of a good plan. Um, they can have all of the instructions for the administration and distribution of an estate in one place. They provide for many contingencies and conditions that we really can't cover in any other single document. They, they provide a tremendous amount of flexibility for the administration and distribution of estate in the future. They're more private than any other mechanism. The, the legislature stripped us a little of that uh, a few years ago, they're more public than they used to be, but they are still more private than any other mode that we can use. And they're really easier to amend and keep updated than any other mechanisms. You hear of several different kinds of trusts, lifetime trust, you hear the phrase revocable living trust or living trust. A living trust simply means you created it during your lifetime. A revocable trust means you retain the power to amend it or to revoke it. Uh, other lifetime trusts are irrevocable trusts, and, and you know, as the name says, you give up the right to revoke it. We use those primarily in two circumstances. One is we create an irrevocable trust to benefit someone who may be receiving public assistance, and those are usually means tested one way or another. So if you have too many resources available to you, you don't qualify for public assistance. So these trusts will enable us to create a benefit for someone receiving public assistance that doesn't deprive them of the public assistance, but meets needs that cannot or are not met by the public assistance. Those trusts are, are pretty technical in their nature. They have to be irrevocable but they are very effective for that. The other irrevocable trust that you may hear of is, a, is an islet, an irrevocable life insurance trust, and that's an estate tax planning instrument by which we provide for resources to be available for your beneficiaries, ultimately, that keeps them out of your estate, keeps the proceeds out of your estate for federal estate tax purposes. So those are the kinds of irrevocable trusts you'll hear of. And then you also hear of testamentary trusts or trusts that are created within a will. Uh, after your death, they do the same thing that a revocable trust could do. The only problem with them is it takes that will and that probate to get that thing funded so they're just not as economical or functional as these revocable trusts. All right, we know 
what we have to deal with. We know who we're going to deal with, and we know what the tools are that we're going to use to get there. How do we get there? Well, the first thing to remember is, with respect to most things, nobody does it better than you. Uh, I want to remind you, each of you, for yourselves and for your family, can do more, more effectively, and more economically than anybody else can. The inconvenience and expense that you may incur in putting together and implementing your state plan pale in comparison to the expense and difficulties others will have to undertake if you don't do something affirmatively in advance. Probate is expensive because basically you're paying one or several people to do things that you could do yourself very quickly and easily. Now this is a simplified example, but hopefully it gets the point across. If you want to sell me your car, you endorse the title and you give it to me, I give you a check, you give me a bill of sale and you're done. I go to the license office and apply for a new title. It's that simple. I jumped ahead of myself there, sorry. If you become disabled and that car needs to be sold, a conservator will have to be appointed by the court to give them authority to endorse that title for you and deliver it and the bill of sale, and that's about a $2,500 process. Now, there's a lot of exceptions to that, but this happens and that's the cost of it. So the simple circumstance versus that circumstance is kind of what I'm talking about. If you've died and the car has to be disposed of, either sold or transferred to your beneficiaries, that's usually an $800 to $1,000 process at a minimum. And that's real costs or real work that has to be done that, that can be avoided by doing some of this uh, estate planning that we're talking about. So nobody does it better than you. A penny saved is a penny earned, and, and we all know anymore that's not quite true. You have to earn a penny and a half or a penny and three quarters to end up with a penny. But if you've saved that penny, you've saved it. Uh, the state planning is unavoidable. It's being done for you by the legislature and the courts, and those rules are laid down. It's not like somebody has arbit arbitrary discretion over it, but those rules are out there and it's done in case you don't do it for yourself. And if you do your planning, you have the ability to craft a specific program that fits you and your family like a, like a custom-tailored job. Um, and so then we start talking about these costs. I've mentioned it a little bit. You can estimate that if you don't do anything, you just, you just leave your assets the way they are and you pass and there's a probate estate involved, the cost of that is somewhere between 4% and 8% of your gross work. So you add up the value of all of your assets, your life insurance, retirement plans, and multiply that by 4% and 8%, and the cost of processing that estate is four, to, is four to eight percent of that gross work. The cost of doing these things that we've been talking about so far, collecting this information and getting it into a plan, is going to be about one-tenth of that amount. I've been doing this for a long time, and that's the way the math works out. Some are more, some are less, but most of them are going to fit in that kind of a range. So you can kind of estimate for yourself what the economic benefit of getting these things done for yourself. And like I said, these are real costs. That 4% to 8% is real work that somebody's going to have to do. It's not like the money just evaporates. The government doesn't take it. It is you're paying for expenses, many of which you could avoid by doing some of this. Planning. Okay. So there we are. Now it's we start trying to get things down and you begin to think, and, and COVID has made this a big issue for us. We got to have a lot of meetings. Tom's talking about meeting with the lawyers. He's talking about meeting with the trusted advisors. He's talking about meeting with the family and extended family and other people. We begin to be concerned about our social distancing requirements. And this, it, it came on so quickly, it threw us all for a loop very quickly, but estate planning was particularly critical because we were trying to get instruments done and we weren't being allowed to have contact with our with our clients and the other important people. So uh, we've taken great steps in making that easier. 
the social distancing requirements, we keep in mind what the government's telling us and suggesting to us and what the medical professionals are telling us and suggesting to us. Institutional requirements are more strict, and I'm talking about everything from apartment buildings to independent living, supervised living, uh, assisted living, skilled nursing, and hospitals. So we are able to work in all of those circumstances to get every one of these steps done, whether the client themselves is in one of those situations or uh, somebody else that we need access to is in one of those situations. And then the most important thing for all of us and the most important thing for me certainly is every individual's personal needs and requirements with regard to this social distancing and making sure that we're safe and the people with whom we deal are safe. And there are countless ways now we've worked out to address all of those needs and meet them and get plans done well and efficiently and in a timely, in a timely way. So be assured that those concerns that we all have now, and it doesn't look like they're going to go away anytime soon. We were kind of hoping, and maybe it was just hope at the beginning, that this would be a quick fix. It's not going to be, and it looks like with, with the way things go, we're going to be having these kinds of programs in place. This technology that we're using here has certainly helped a lot. Uh, Zoom meetings we have with clients, we have with trusted advisors, we have with everybody that's involved in these things. So it has become a great tool for us as well. And I think everybody's getting more comfortable with it. I am, although you, you may question that here as I flip to the wrong screen. All right, we know the tools. We're, we know how to begin to work on these things. So as we get here toward the end, we are, and I'm gonna summarize a little bit, as you put these things together, you're going to get an idea about what you can do and what you can't do. And that's included in your list of assets and liabilities and the important people and entities that we've been, talked about, been talking about and you've advised, you've been able to compare the costs of these, the costs and benefits of each one, and you begin to be able to have an idea of where you need help and when you need it. In this day and age, despite some folks' insistence or proclamations that they, they know it all, that's impossible. And the cost of getting help when and where you need it is only a fraction of the cost of someone else having to try to attend to all of these matters from scratch. The folks with expertise can eliminate all the uncertainty and give you the peace of mind you should have and that your family and your loved ones should have as you live and enjoy them in the rest of your lives. One of the considerations in estate planning that I've mentioned is charitable giving. Most folks, as I said before, who are beginning their work to create an estate plan have not yet begun to decide whether and to what extent they want to include charitable giving as a part of their plan. So as you begin, I encourage you to do that because it frequently ends up that that becomes a part of the plan and no one's thought about it. So uh, what I recommend and because you've joined here through the UMSA Legacy Council presentation, I recommend you to talk with Sharon Finolio, our host and the Associate Vice Chancellor of University Advancement. She can provide you with planned giving options that can be incorporated into a comprehensive plan that would, would provide benefits that you, you couldn't imagine with that kind of a help. So at the beginning here, as you begin to think about it, just keep that in your mind and know that that resource is readily available to you. Okay, so here we are. We're going to sit back and we're going to look at these things and we're going to decide what makes sense for you and your family. You're going to evaluate the benefits and drawbacks of all of these options. And then an important piece is to evaluate the practicality. Um, we, we sometimes come up with great ideas and we have great tools and we have great plans, but when we apply that to the people that are actually involved or the circumstances, they may just not work. And we have to look at other ways to accomplish that. And that can be whether it's asset oriented or whether it's liability and debt oriented or whether it's people oriented. The, the practicalities of it become very important as we try to put flesh on these bones and make something work. 
you weigh the cost of each of those options, you weigh the benefits of them, and then you create this plan and you implement your custom plan on your terms. It's, it, mo most of these things are revocable and amendable. You review that plan every few years and on the occurrence of a major life event or for you or for anybody that's important to you, birth, death, marriage, divorce, disability, career changes, or other ma major life events, for anybody that you've named in these things is a reason to dust off the old documents and see if they still apply. And when you've done that, you can legitimately relax. You have done everything that you can do. So again, I thank you all for your attention. I hope it's been some information that has been beneficial to you. I encourage you that if you plan well, you can live confidently, and that is our goal. Uh, Tom, I, thank you so much for that presentation. This is Sharon again, and I just want to remind people if they have questions for Tom, they can utilize the Q&A bar at the bottom of your screen. A few questions have come in. We're going to answer what we can, and then um, what we don't have time to get to, we will uh, email answers to participants um, uh, in the next few days. But, but Tom, here's one question. I do not have a big estate. Why do I need a trust? Well, that, that's a great question. And it's possible that you don't. But these are very efficient instruments. They're more efficient than not having a will or trust. And, and I think the easiest example that I can, I can give you is Bill Gates. I expect that in the last two months, Bill Gates probably lost about $25 billion and he didn't lose a night's sleep. But for myself and the folks that, that I know, if we lost $25,000, it was incredibly unsettling. And so if the less that we have in absolute terms, the relatively more important it is and the better protection you can give it by doing this kind of, this kind of planning. Very, very well said. I, I have another uh, question here. If, if I have a will as opposed to a trust, does my estate have to go through probate? Yes, wills only work in probate. Um, the, we, we can put in a will, you can name somebody to be the guardian for your children. Um, you can name, you can nominate somebody to be a guardian for yourself. But other than that, and those are both probate oriented things, wills only work in probate. So you're buying yourself a probate estate if you're relying only on a will. Okay, so here's another one from Jennifer. She says, what's the best way to go about establishing a trust? Is this something I can do myself using online resources or do I need a lawyer? It, it is something that you can do uh, by going online. The trusts that you might find online are created by lawyers, although they all have disclaimers on them that they are not offering legal advice. The trouble with those in my experience is there are no form trusts online that are created in Missouri. Now, when you create a trust or a will or any instrument like that, it's gonna distribute your property no matter where you live, even in most foreign countries. But the administration of them is governed by the local rules. And if you live in St. Louis County, I draw a will and a trust that is administered probably going to be administered in St. Louis County, certainly in Missouri, and we can adopt the law that we want. And each of these laws are specific to the states in which the instruments are drawn. Additionally, those online systems cannot cover, do not cover the detail of the circumstances that any individual faces. They cover the details of the circumstances that most individuals will face. And so they don't, they do they do a lot of things fairly. They don't do any particular thing very well as far as I'm concerned. I have lawyers, even lawyers come to my door and they say, hey, how much for a 
you know, for an estate plan, if I were going to do an estate plan, I say, well, $10,000, because that's the only way that I can be sure that I cover everything that needs to be covered. But if you come sit down with me and you tell me your story and we go through all these things that we've talked about, the range can be anywhere from $500 to, you know, three or 4,000, maybe 5,000, depending on the estate. So it's much easier with the more specific information you have to be sure that you get something that works for you and your Great. That, thank you, Tom. Um, I have a question here from Sharon. There's another Sharon out there. Um, and she asks, if you have a trust, do you need a will? Well, as I said, hopefully not. Hopefully the will is just the safety net. Uh, if, if you create a trust, what we do is we fund the trust. That is one way or another, we make all of your property subject to that trust. If everything is subject to the trust, then there will be no probate assets and therefore you wouldn't need a will. But every now and then it happens, somebody misses an asset or they just have an asset that they don't want to put in their trust for one reason or another. If you own a lake property with your five siblings, you may not want to put your interest in a trust so you leave it out. Well, that's a probate asset and you end up with your will then putting it in your trust. The thing that happens most often, Sharon, is you, you create your trust and you fund it and all of your property is in it. And then your parent dies and you inherit something from them. But before that estate is closed and you actually get that property, you die. And then it takes your will to put that in your trust. So we create it as a safety net and then hope that we don't have to rely on it. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's, that makes sense. Um, so Tom, Teresa's going back to, back to trust, the trust answer in her question. And it's a good one. She said, I've heard lawyers say that trusts are no longer worth having unless you have more than $4 million in assets. What are they trying to say? given that you have suggested that trusts are valuable even if you don't have a great amount of assets. Yeah, that's an interesting thing to say. One, one of the things that we're experiencing, I talked about corporate, and I don't know the answer to that. I'm not sure why a lawyer would say that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think they are valuable right down to the point where there's maybe only one or two assets that are fairly easy to deal with with a power of attorney and some kind of a transfer on death because there's just so many risks that we can avoid mm -hmm. with them. One of the things we do experience is corporate trustees, the, the corporate trust companies find it not to be economical to serve as a trustee if an estate is worth anywhere from two million to four million dollars. We have to we have to shop for corporate trustees to serve if if they're between two million to four million, and generally, if they're below two million, it's hard to get a corporate trustee to serve at all. So that's the only, only dollar amount reasoning I can I can think of. Sorry. Yeah, I I, I would I, that certainly wouldn't be the advice that that I've heard, but it was a good question. And I have another one from from Pamela, who says, can tax deferred investments like four hundred one k accounts be placed and included in a trust? Yes, they can. We look specifically at all of the surrounding circumstances when we do that. Uh, and there's really too many of them to go in here, but yes, we want one way or another to ensure that whatever plan attaches to those, if nothing else works, that trust is gonna be the, con the controlling instrument. We just don't want it to fall into a, a situation where probate would have to administer right. it. And I, I might I might add that some of those tax deferred accounts that's a great uh, those are great assets to defer to your charitable gifts because then the income tax isn't paid out of your estate because uh, and it saves that income tax on your heirs so if you are considering making a charitable gift uh, through your trust or will or estate planning um, designating your your tax sheltered retirement accounts for those charitable gifts will ultimately um, be the best uh, decision for your heirs. Yeah, and, and those are great opportunities, and that's why I, I emphasize that too, that charitable giving provides us 
leverage opportunities that we don't necessarily have. So you can get more bang for your buck by doing that. Exactly. That's right. Um, so here's a question, another question we've had. What happens if I die without a will? Big brothers. Mistake <laughs> plan. We That's have, it. you've heard, you may have heard the phrase intestate succession. There is a statute that says, here's what happens with your property if you die without a will. And I, I know the first few levels, but that, that statute looks out to nine degrees of relation for people that are related to you in order to distribute the property to them, depending on who you have spouse, then kids, then parents and siblings, grandparents and cousins, and up, the, up and down that tree. So yes, this, there's a statute that says, this is what happens with your property in the event of your death. And these guardianship and conservatorship statutes say, this is what happens if you become disabled and you haven't done these things. So here's one more. Um, I'm worried my family will contest my will. What can I do to prevent this from happening? Uh, talk with a lawyer about <laughs> creating an estate plan that will protect that. That is a, that is a area ripe for litigation and lawyers that do estate planning and do wills and trusts are familiar with what it takes to make a valid will and a valid trust and and all of the instruments that go into that so your best protection is a lawyer that that does those things and understands those problems absolutely okay here's one that i i, I haven't heard it um from joyce does t-o-d mean probate such as a car no t-o-d means transfer on death <laughs> Mm -hmm. where you've taken a, a title to the car and you take it to the Department of Revenue and you say, I want this to transfer on death to so-and-so. Mm -hmm. And then on, on death, you take that title and you take the death certificate and the, the Department of Revenue will transfer the title over to the transfer on death beneficiary. Great. Well, um, that, that's all on our live Q&A chat box, but I want to encourage everybody, if they have questions after this presentation, feel free to email me. Oh, it looks like we have another one coming in. Hold on. My parents are elderly. What should I recommend they do to protect their assets? Well, you know, that depends on the relationship with the, with the parent and how mm -hmm. free they are to talk about it. Some folks will go to them and ask them some of these questions. Have you done anything to prepare for the inevitable? And you can use whatever delicacy you need and just ask them about that. Some, some relationships are such that the, the kid can go to the parent and say, hey, uh, I have an idea. We're gonna need to start planning for the next phase in your life and I'd like for you to talk with somebody about it. Now, the lawyer is gonna be sure that everyone knows that mom and dad are the clients. Uh, I can't have a kid come in here and tell me how to put his parents' estate plan together. The parents are the, the decision makers, but to help them get connected with somebody and then let them do it is the best way to do it. Great advice, Tom. Um, looks like we have one more coming in here. We still have a few more minutes, so I'm gonna keep taking them. Sure. Um, this is from Teresa. Please clarify, are there still federal estate taxes? Yes, there are still federal <laughs> estate taxes. Yes. Generally, if your estate is over about $11.5 million, everything over $11.5 million will be subject to tax. If you're married, each spouse has $11.5 million and that's portable now, so a set of spouses gets the $23 million total. And then we have estate taxes on the amounts over that. And it accelerates pretty quickly. And you yeah. eventually get to the place at which they make up for the tax that they lost on the first 11 and a half minutes if the estate gets big enough. That's right. So we're going back uh, from Brenda to a transfer on death question. And she asks, if you have designated TOD or POD on all of your assets, is it necessary to have a trust or will? Well, they do two different things. The, 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 on your death, no, there's no reason to have a, a 
will or a trust, if everything is TOD, on your death, it is going to pass to the beneficiaries. The problem mm -hmm. is if the beneficiary of a transfer on death dies before you do, then you have a probate asset again. If you decide that you're going to change those beneficiaries, then you just have to do it with respect to each individual asset that you have. Um, so the, the will is going to pick up where the TOD fails. The other problem with the TOD is if you become disabled, you don't have any trust to protect your finances and a conservatorship then becomes necessary to administer those assets. And so it's gonna be a conservatorship asset, even though then on your death, it's going to pass to the TOD beneficiary, unless it's all been spent. If it's a bank account, it has to be spent to care for you, then it'll be gone. But the risk is if you become disabled, it is no help at all. If the beneficiary dies, it is no help. And if you decide you wanna change those designations, it's, it's a bigger pain in the neck than amending the trust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really very, very good advice, Tom, as, as this whole hour has been. And again, I think we're going to wrap things up. I'm going to let everybody know that we'll be sending this link. We've recorded this webinar, and we'll also be posting it on the UMSL website, and we'll let you know where you'll be able to find that. Um, but we're very grateful to Tom Nations for... Uh, lending his time and expertise in a, in a, you know, in a new way. This is the first time we've done the, this Zoom webinar, webinar before. So, uh, Tom, you've done a great job, and we're really grateful. And we appreciate all of you for, um, for your time and attention this evening and wish you a really lovely evening. And um, uh, thank you for, for being here and supporting UMSL. And thank you so much, Tom. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye.